yes, that music can only mean one thing, and that is that it is time for home studio Q and A for yet another week here on Studio Live today. My name is Pete, and this is my channel where I strive, I desire to help you create, record, and release your best music, and I do that through tips, tricks, tutorials, and live video Q and As just like this one. If that's your bag and you haven't already, consider subscribing today on the show. Got a bunch of your questions from through the week. We have a bunch of folks here live on Facebook and YouTube who will be contributing and asking any questions that they may have, and uh, we will dive in and get into that. But as we do each week, let's kick off with our topic of the week. And this week, I'm talking about something a bit different, and this is more of an overarching. This isn't a specific question I get, but more of an overarching concept and theory that kind of answers a lot of questions, and it's, uh, it's cognitive bias or opinions and how you interpret opinions. So I wanted to cover off on this briefly because it was interesting recently doing some reviews of Cubasis 3 and Aurea Pro and GarageBand. And I did a, a video last week where I compared the three and I said, here's what I like and dislike about each one. And here's the ultimate sort of decision at the end. And because I'm me, I sat squarely on the fence and said, all three of these are awesome. They're just awesome for different people and for different reasons. And that's, that got me thinking that a lot of the questions I get and the, the typical questions I get are, what compressor setting should I use? Or what is the best mic for under $100? What headphones should I use? What software should I use? And these are fine questions. These deserve answers. And I give answers. But what I've realized is in the last year, I've adjusted the way that I provide feedback. And I've used two phrases every time I provide feedback, which I think are lacking and missing a lot uh, from where I see other people giving advice. And that is, in my opinion and in my experience. Because in my opinion and in my experience, basically, as soon as I put that <laughs> disclaimer on any statement, then I can't be wrong. Because in my opinion something is the case. And in my experience, this is what's happened. However, what a lot of what happened with a lot of folks is that they rely on expert opinion and then they take that expert opinion as fact and then they drive that fact home. And that is something, again, called cognitive bias. And that means that you surround yourself, you take other people's opinion on as fact. And the challenge with this is um, it often then leads to something else called confirmation bias. Have you heard of this one? So confirmation bias is that you'll only accept facts that support your current view. So it's really easy if you're a Pro Tools user, it's really easy to go out there and find a whole bunch of information, a whole bunch of people talking about why Pro Tools is the only DAW you should ever use and GarageBand is crap. And if you hang around the right sort of people, you'll get that opinion over and over again. It's only if you go and you delve into the other side of any argument that you will get other opinions and other experiences. And that is super important. I I do, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in a GarageBand forum on Facebook and in the Create, Record, Release around very similar people. But I do occasionally step into other places just to see what goes on there. I don't always enjoy it. Uh, but it's important, I think, to hear other opinions because you can get so wound up in the hype of what you're thinking based on what someone you respect thinks and what someone they respect thinks that you're not actually using that logic to determine, is this the right answer for me in this situation right now. So when you have questions like, what's the best mic to use? Well, if I'm a trumpet player, having a nice sensitive condenser microphone is not going to be right. So again, it depends. But if I just said my default answer, which is Audio-Technica AT2020, and someone blows their trumpet into it, they're probably going to get a really harsh sound. They'll want like a nice dynamic microphone instead. So they're the sort of things that I think we need to be super careful of. Um, some other concepts here um, is that sometimes when you, that there's the other two phrases that, that I think we need to sort of just embrace a lot more of, and I've, I've been doing this a heap because I love making mistakes. I love doing things wrong. And I love saying, yeah, I was wrong. Originally, I had this thought. It's kind of like the scientific method. Originally, I had this thought. Here was my hypothesis, but then I tried it, and my experience has been this. So I was wrong. I had the wrong idea up here. And the other one that I love, and it's related to this show, is I don't know. Hopefully you realize that if someone asks a question that I don't know, I'm very, very conscious to say, I don't know the answer to that one. Hopefully someone here in the Studio Live Today community does know the answer and they can provide that assistance. But there is nothing worse than someone, because they are the quote unquote expert, that they think they should have to answer every question. And I, early on, I got caught in that where I would go and I would research for hours to answer other people's questions. I'm like, I'll do the Googling for you. Whereas now like, you know what? That's not my area of expertise. Someone someone comes on the channel and they're like, hey, how do I connect a, a audio interface to an Android phone? I'll say, 
I'm sorry, that's not my area of expertise. You might have to find a forum of people that use Android devices. So that's uh, it's just something that I wanted to, to, to put out there, that in my experience and in my opinion are really important phrases. And if you, if you find folks that are making definitive statements, just make sure that you sprinkle them with a grain or a shaker or maybe a giant mound of salt because it's not always going to be the right answer for you. There's often no right, wrong, yes, no, good, bad. And often you need to get a diverse range of opinions. That's why I say to people, don't listen to what just I say, especially about products or about methods or about processes. You can try the way that I say, because that's my experience and it works for me. If it doesn't, find someone else and try their method. That's uh, that's the answer. So there you go. Now that I've answered that, uh, I'm not going to answer any questions because I don't know any answers. No, uh, we will dive in and get started with some questions here. So let's uh, see what questions have come in through the week, shall we? We'll throw some up here on the screen. I'll take a quick cough. Excuse me. Uh, and we'll get stuck into this. So uh, I've done videos about cleaning your audio, about reducing hiss and rumble and other noises. And a question I get often is like this one from Voice Sync, which is, can it remove click noise on audio? Now, I get asked this a lot, and usually what it's caused by is when there's a click noise, is people that are editing together. So if you're editing sounds together, often where you, that split point is, you'll get a sort of click sound. And you know, it, this has been around since the days of the old tape where you'd try to pause it and then you'd re-record and you'd sort of cut in and you get that click or that pop in there. They can actually be super hard to remove. When it comes to editing, the, the number one, uh, in my experience, the number one thing that you can do there is to make sure your edit points are not near a sound. So it's, it's tempting to go to try and edit, you cut it right on the bar marker, but the bar marker is usually the worst place to put an edit point because that's usually right at the end or the start of a strum or a note or something that's going to cause a click. So go slightly before or slightly after the bar marker and edit there. And in the wonderful world of digital, when we've got uh, the non-destructive editing, you can do that. You can just shimmy it a little bit to the side and then you get the end of the last note and then it cuts before it comes into the start of the next note. That can work well for, for editing and, and getting uh, rid of those clicks. Um, if the click is just there because something else went wrong in the recording, they can be hard to remove. You can try something like Bruce Free, B-R-U-S-F-R-I. It is the best noise remover plugin, but the problem with Bruce Free is it actually samples your background noise and then it will turn down those frequencies of the background noise. So that's great for hiss and rumble and things like that. But if you have random clicks and pops in your music, it's hard to sample that and therefore it's hard to actually remove it, especially if it's happening at a time where your music is actually playing. Now, if it's crackling and popping before the music and you can sample that, then Bruce Free might have a half a chance at doing it once you actually go back and play. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that helps you out if you are having that problemo. We'll continue on here. Now, I did a review and I released a video yesterday about a new headphone adapter. And it's this one here. It's this big, big chungus that we have here. I'll just uh, come across here so you can take a look. There it is. This is the Energizer Lightning to US, no, Lightning to three and a half mil adapter. And uh, yeah, so that I can use real headphones on my iPhone and I take this with me wherever I go because I've been through about six of the little Apple ones in the last like 12 months. They last me about two months every time. Uh, so someone said, uh, I added some shrink wrap to my Apple one and it stiffens up and extends its life. This wasn't actually a question, but I thought that was a pretty cool idea. I've heard of other people doing that, of putting shrink wrap around them, using gaffer tape, um, doing other things to just make sure that those little connections stayed stayed okay. I've decided I've splurged. I spent $30 on a little piece of plastic because that's how I roll. Uh, so we'll see how, we'll see how this one goes but if you missed the review uh check it out i don't know the only problem is i couldn't find where to buy them anywhere uh outside of australia so we have them at our supermarkets at Woolworths supermarkets in australia i don't know where they are maybe your walmarts and somewhere like that might sell things like this i don't know so let me know if you do find one let me know about it question about usb drives and ios so we had a question here uh, about the files app. Uh, what files app? I can't get my iPad to show my pictures and to select or to move them. Now I know most folks that are watching, if you've been around the channel for a while, will be aware of the files app. It is an app itself and it's on your iPhone or iPad. It's on there by default, but you may have deleted it not knowing what it was or not knowing what it did, but it is super important to managing your files. So it is literally just called files. If you go to the app store and search files, you can search my name, Pete Johns and files app 
and I've got a complete video explaining exactly how it works and all the different things you can do with it. But what you can do is access all the files on your device. You can access anything on your iCloud drive and you can access anything on any other cloud storage platforms like Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, Box, uh, yeah, yeah, all the ones. Uh, but you can also access external devices. So if you've got a Lightning to USB 3 adapter or if you've got an iPad Pro, a USB-C to USB adapter, you can plug in your USB drives and then you can transfer your stuff from your things to your other things, which is, uh, which is a good thing to do. Uh, one more question here and then we'll jump into the questions from folks here live. Uh, so I, I did a video a while back about the different connection types about XLR, TRS and Hi Z or Hi Z. What's the difference between all of these? What do you need to use? So a question here from Sil is, uh, can I use TS from my ukulele to guitar amp, which has quarter inch input? Yes, you can and should. Uh, or taking audio output from my TV to guitar amp speaker using TS or better to have TRS. Thanks. So I wanted to touch on this one because when you're talking audio sources, uh, you just all you need to do is break it down to this point: is that if one of the sources is unbalanced, excuse me a moment. Apologies for those on the audio version of this. Uh, I'm muting and coughing about uh, every five or ten minutes. So uh, if if you're hearing blank audio, that's me. So if you're looking at your devices, if either of them is unbalanced, you don't need to use a balanced cable. Now, what's a balanced cable? Well, it's something like an XLR or a TRS. And balanced cable simply means that there's two copies of the signal as well as the ground wire. One is flipped around. They travel together. At the end of it, they're flipped back, and there's some magic voodoo in there that makes that reduce the noise. Basically, it can cancels out any of the interference or the noise that it's hearing, that that reversed signal going through there. Um, so yeah, balanced is good, but you need balanced at both ends. So if you're plugging in a guitar into a balanced TRS input on a mixer or an audio interface, using a TRS cable not only won't help, but it probably won't even work because your guitar is only going to send an unbalanced signal. You need to use a standard instrument cable or a TS cable to connect up your guitar. The same thing if you're, if you're outputting from a TV. Now, most TVs will have an unbalanced output either via RCA or uh, by a three, uh, three and a half mil stereo headphone jack. Both of those are unbalanced uh, outputs, but unbalanced stereo outputs. So if you're plugging that into something again, that is an unbalanced, like, like a guitar amplifier, uh, then yeah, you can use unbalanced. Now most guitar amps that have a single mono input will just be a quarter inch TS. There are some guitar amps that have stereo inputs that do actually use either dual, uh, dual TRS for stereo or even something like RCA, which is unbalanced. So you just need to check the, the specs of the gear that you're using and make sure that it is the right stuff. But if, you, if in doubt, I mean, the thing is TS, your standard instrument cable is going to work. It just, if you're finding it noisy, you're getting some interference and noise in your signal, it may be related to that. Uh, righty dokey, let's come back over. Uh, I've got a couple of other folks who've dropped in. So hello to Gary Hubs. We've got Arnie G in the house. Uh, and I think I saw Sion and Russ and a few other folks. So if anyone has any questions here, uh, please uh, ask those. Um, so Scott. Scott says, glad to see all the questions on vocals. I'm struggling. Part of my problem, aside I'm not a singer, is I'm afraid to sing with family around all the time. I guess I just need to get over it. This is, uh, this is a really good point, question, statement to make, Scott, because this is, I think, the number one thing holding people back from recording, especially vocals, especially songs that have lyrics. And I struggle with it for a long time. The reason that I've only been creating music, and when I first started creating music, here's, here's the deal. Uh, when I first started creating music, I would get up at about 5 a.m., I would come downstairs really quietly, and I would sneak into the, the built-in robe, like the wardrobe, the cupboard here, uh, just next to the studio, and I would very quietly sing into my little my condenser microphone on my iPad. And as soon as I heard the, the immediate stirrings of anyone in the house, I would stop and I would come out and they'd be like, what, what are you doing? I'd be like, oh, nothing, uh, nothing at all. Because again, it, it is, it can be really self-conscious, especially if you're doubting your own abilities. It can be really, uh, really daunting and you can be really self-conscious to do that. How did I go from there to being the big loud mouth that I don't care what people do? Well, it's it's like, like anything in life. I, I didn't flick a switch. I didn't get go from feeling it to not feeling it but it's about repetition. It's about continuing to do it. And what I realized was I'm not actually a that bad singer. <laughs> I can actually sing decently and I shouldn't be ashamed of what I do. And you know what? My family don't care. 
that there, there, there's the real thing. There's the real rub. There's there's basically two people. There's the people that won't care because they love you anyway, and they don't care what you do. They want you to be happy. And anyone that doesn't, um, yeah, the problem sits more with them than with you. So uh, basically, it doesn't matter. And the other thing I'll say to that is. We, as usually as creative types and usually as int introverted types, like most of us are, uh, not everyone's different, but most of us are creative, we are self-conscious and we are slightly introverted. We think other people are thinking and worrying about things the same level we are. They're simply not. <laughs> They're not at all. Not everyone is going to be like you. And people overestimate how much other people care about the things that they're doing, which is a great thing for things like this. A little bit of a worry for some of the, uh, the, some of the selfish behavior we see in society in general, because it's pretty clear that people are looking out for number one. But the positive of this is that people aren't actually sitting around thinking about you or wondering what you're doing or, or judging you anywhere near as much as, uh, as you probably think. Sorry, I got off on a bit of a rant on that one, but it's something close to my heart because I was there. I went through it. I still go through it. There's a time, there's times now where like my, my kids and my wife will be getting ready and they'll be sitting there. And it's when I started doing this, I'm talking to a camera. Like I know there's people, I know I'm talking to people, but it's still pretty weird and daunting to do that. And I'll be like flailing around and getting into a passionate rant like this, knowing that someone's standing the other side of the door. That, that does take a while to get used to, but it's again, it's repetition. Once you get used to it, that muscle memory kicks in and then you just do it and you just don't care. You realize that it's something you want to do. You just do it. Uh, question, Ruru. That's a very cool name, Ruru. Uh, if I want to add some singing to my song but I can't sing, how can I make my voice sound good? Uh, good, good question. How do you make your voice sound good? Uh, practice. Practice does make progress with any of these sort of things. So if you are struggling and if you want to sound better, practicing your craft is a good thing to do. You can take singing lessons. You can go to YouTube channels online that talk about singing. Here's the thing. Most people have the ability to learn how to hit notes. And that's really all that singing is. Because you don't need to sing like your favorite singer. You don't need to sing like someone else. You just need to find the way that you sing and then practice and enhance that until it's the best that it can be. I don't really believe, there's, I think I've read some studies, there's about 2% of people that are so, so tone deaf that they can't actually enjoy and appreciate music. The other 98, 99% of us uh, are absolutely fine. And I don't even, I think, they've, again, they've done studies that you can still train yourself to do that, to, to, to sing and to, uh, to hit notes if you try to. So it is less about having that, you know, the God-given ability and the talent to be able to do it. That obviously helps if you have natural talent. If you don't, you just have to work a little harder. It's like it's like your studies and your schoolwork. Some people naturally can just sort of fall over the line and get get things done because they just pick things up. Other people have to grind it out and just keep and just try really hard. Either way, uh, yeah, practice. I know that's a, that's a pretty uh, pretty sort of standard answer to say mm, just keep practicing, but uh, definitely it. Yeah. Uh, hey Pete, I want to write a song, but I only know E minor and A sustain too. Any advice for me? Uh, <laughs> is it going to be practice again? Uh, yeah, look, it, it, it's hard when, you, when you're playing the guitar. My, my advice is uh, use some loops. Uh, use GarageBand and the virtual keyboard to play some other chords. Uh, use some uh, pitch shifting and time shifting to take, take your E minor and bring it up to an F minor. Like there's, there's different and creative ways to do that. And then, yeah, just again, same, same answer. Start going to some guitar channels online, learn yourself a C chord, learn yourself a D chord, learn yourself a G chord, and then you're pretty much done. <laughs> Use the caged method, C-A-G-E-D. They're basically the five chord shape patterns that you need to know. Practice them over and over again. Do your 10,000 hours or you know, at least a few hundred hours learning. And then, yeah, you'll be able to continue improving and getting better over time. So, uh, or, or create something with E minor and A. Just do it. Uh, let's have a look for a cat. Uh, oh, for a catalog of, uh, of cognitive biases, check out, you are not so smart. There you go. But a uh, good, good advice there. So yeah, uh, if you, if you do want to learn, it's really fascinating stuff. Uh, the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect is sort of a similar kind of thing. Like uh, I love the psychology of these sort of things, um, around opinions and biases. It's a lot of fun to learn about. And when, once you know about it, then you'll spot it in the world, uh, all the time. And you'll be like, wow, that person really just thinks that thing and nothing is going to sway them. In fact, uh, that they're going to basically do that thing like the kids do. They put their fingers in the ears and go, la, 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 can't hear you, can't hear you. <laughs> That's kind of the, the way uh, uh, some, some folks uh, behave. Anyway, uh, we're getting way off track. Uh, do, 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 do. Barry Smith, hello to you. <clears throat> if I was mixing my vocal, what software will give me a better mix to make my vocal sound good? Cubasis 3 or Aurea Pro? Uh, 
either. Both. Depends. Yeah, uh, th this is again another one of those uh, it depends on you and your workflow and what you like. So th neither are going to make things better, but they are. there are ways to make. So for instance, I when I mix a vocal, I do it pretty simply. So what I use on pretty much every vocal is a compressor, EQ, reverb and delay and occasionally some overdrive, just some to add a bit of grit to the tone of my voice. So that's about it. Now, if I do that using the stock plugins in GarageBand, or the stock plugins in Cubasis 3, or the stock plugins in Aurea Pro, it's going to sound about the same. That they're doing the same things. Your compression, you set your attack, you release your threshold, your reverb, you set your reverb space and your time, your delay, you set the delay time and the spread, and then your, your overdrive, you set at what frequency and how much drive you want. So it's more about what you do with the things that you have, what software you're using, than the actual software itself. And again, in my opinion, in my experience, that's the way it is. Now, some people will say that the, the default built-in plugins that you have in Cubasis and Aurea are easier to use and therefore easier to get a high-quality sound than what you'd have to do in GarageBand. That may be their experience and that may be the case for them. I haven't experienced that because I've learned how to make my sounds the way I want them in GarageBand. So uh, yeah, that, that's probably my, my take on that one is it's no, not really better, but different. And that, that's the case with anything, because as I say, and I'm a broken record on this one, but it's digital audio, it's ones and zeros. It's not going to actually make a significant difference because if you're recording in with the same gear, the software platform is still taking those ones and zeros from your analog to digital converter and storing them as a digital audio file. It's what you then do in terms of processing and mixing and arranging and balancing and leveling that is going to turn that high quality input signal into a kick-ass song. So hopefully that uh, that helps explain things a little bit there. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> uh, I like this from Jade on the on the cognitive stuff. In my opinion, I only have an answer based on my experience. Other experiences may differ from mine, so keep making your own mistakes, and so will I. You got it. That's exactly it. Just keep making mistakes. Keep doing things that are, keep trying things that may or may not work for you. It's absolutely fine if you try something and it doesn't work. You, you are one step closer to finding what will work. Every, every failure, every little thing that doesn't work for you. I could go and try and record a reggae song tomorrow and I could find one of two things. I could find out that actually I really love reggae, reggae and, I, and I make a really cool sound or I could absolutely suck at it. But you know what? I'm not going to know until I try it. And if, if I take the opinion of someone that says, unless you uh, have decades of experience mixing reggae, don't even think about making a reggae tune, well then, why would I do that? Why wouldn't I just try it for myself? That's their experience. They may just suck. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I think I saw some more questions here. Sorry, I'm all over the place here with, uh, with the questions. Uh, question uh, from Matthias Wong. Uh, the uh, best AUV3 guitar and flute for GarageBand iOS 13, trying to make a flute and guitar trap type beat. Uh, to be honest, I don't mind the flute sound that we have in GarageBand. Uh, we, do, it is, we do have a flute in GarageBand, don't we? Under the other instruments in GarageBand, there is, I'm pretty sure, a flute sound. Let me just see, do we have, do I have my GarageBand plugged in here? We do. We have my. <laughs> we have that one. Uh, I don't have the screen display for this because I've got my iPhone on there. But let me just see if I can find. I'm pretty sure under keyboard and under more sounds. If we go to other keyboards, other. Don't we have a flute in here? There's a kind of cool flute here. Yeah, I reckon you could go with the garage band flute. I reckon that sounds kind of, kind of cool. Uh, what was the other thing? Uh, guitar. <coughs> Guitars are hard, to be honest. I would try and, if you're making a beat, I would try and find a guitar sample as opposed to actually trying to use a virtual guitar. Uh, the better the better beats that I've heard uh, using guitars use a guitar loop, which is like a real guitar sample. So I would uh, I would go to the GarageBand users Facebook group and tell people what you want. There might be someone there that that loves playing their guitar and they make you the sort of guitar loop that you want because the the standard guitars uh, there are some good uh, audio unit and uh, VST guitar plugins for other platforms. AUV3, for whatever reason, I've just never found. Probably because they're usually really big, um, really big plugins, but I've just never found anything. And uh, as you know, if you've tried to use the guitars, uh, let's just find one here. If you've tried to use the guitars here in GarageBand, 
it sounds like a MIDI guitar from the 1990s, which is nothing wrong with that if that's the vibe you're going for, but it just doesn't sound good. Uh, mixed in with any beats, it just doesn't sound good, in my opinion. Say it with me, folks. Uh, Righty dokey, I'll see. I think I saw another couple of questions. Again, I'm, I'm scrolling up and down. I think I saw one from Amaracia, which I did. Here you are. Uh, the vocals in my song. A lot of vocal stuff today. I like it. The vocals in my thong, 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 my song right now are too loud, but the tiniest possible fraction quieter and they're too quiet. How do I figure out what's going on and mix the right tracks to make it work? Uh, the answer to this, and I don't usually say the answer is one thing because again, it's my experience, but the answer in my experience when I've had this problem is like either two, one of two things. You either need to turn the other instruments in your track down to make space for your vocal. If you're finding if you turn it up, it's too loud, you turn it down, it's too quiet, it's probably that your other instruments are overpowering it. So I've turned down other instruments that are using the same frequency space. Uh, there's actually three things. Uh, look at your EQ, because this can often be related to the EQ. Maybe your vocals are sitting in a particular range and other instruments are taking up that range as well. So you may need to, again, EQ other instruments down. So maybe don't turn them down, but go to the EQ and make some room in that sort of mid-range, mid to high high frequencies to make room for your vocals. And the third and probably easiest one is compression. So compression can fix this sort of thing. And that's why I say, if you've got a vocal, you just turn up and it's too loud. If you add compression, what it's, because what it's doing is squashing down the peaks and then bringing everything else up level, it usually helps with that sort of thing because it makes the vocal sound at the right volume. Whereas if you turn it up, some parts may be too loud, some parts too quiet. If you turn it down, everything's too quiet. Like it's not actually cutting through. So uh, that's, Three, three tips that I would give there uh, that you go away with to look at is volume of other instruments, EQ of your other tracks, and then compression on your vocals. I think if you look at those three things, you might be able to uh, find a better balance. Uh, question from Matthias. Can you download a VST instrument from Safari to GarageBand iOS? No. Sorry, that's going to be a quick one. No, as I just mentioned, there are some cool VST plugins. It would be really lovely to have on your iPad or your iPhone. It doesn't work. Uh, there is no ability to put a UV3 on that one. Uh, let's have a look. I'm just scrolling on up to see if we have any other questions. We'll have one final chance for you to ask any questions right at the end of the show. So if you do, if you do have a question and I've missed it, or you uh, you want to ask it again, then jump back. We've got one more here from uh, from Ted, Ted Jumadadi. Any tips on making GarageBand <laughs> tune sound less GarageBandy? Awkward, I know. Yeah, so there's a couple of things to do with that. Um, to sprinkle in some third-party plugins can help. So one that I like to, to make it less garage bandy, and yeah, I do know, I do know what you mean. I don't have my again, I don't have the display up here, but there's a uh, there's a plugin that I love called the FAC Maxima. So if there's one plugin that you want to kind of just make your tracks punch, if you like, this is a good song but I think it could be a great song and I just uh, it's just not hitting. Uh, if you want a free version, Rough Rider, Rough Rider 3 is a compressor that can really make your stuff punch through, it can give you that punchy drums and bass and guitar and vocal tones that can just really kick through. Uh, or the FAC Maxima, it's about a $10, $15 plugin that can, uh, can help as well. Outside of that, bringing in like real instruments can really help real sounds found sounds which is just you know going out with your phone and sampling some things if you uh, listen to some like folks like Billie Eilish and uh, other uh, folks that are creating music and her brother whose name escapes me who's her producer fin Finis Finis maybe um yeah, that, they talk all about this, that the how they get the texture and the tone of it, and it doesn't just sound like, you know, seven virtual instruments together, is that they're going to bring in different tones. And the way to do that is your own voice. So obviously adding voice and backing vocals and weird little just random oohs and ahs in your songs can really help sound less garage bandy. Uh, and then f finding sounds. So I, I saw an interview with Billie Eilish where she was in Australia, of all places, and I don't know if you have this in other parts of the world, but uh, for blind folks... We have uh, at the pedestrian crossings, we have a sound. It goes beep, beep, beep. And then when the light goes green, the little man says walk. It goes beep, dee, 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 dee. So she was listening to that and she's like, that's a cool sound. I want to put that sound in my song. Gets out her phone, records that down, brings it in, puts it in logic, changes the pitch, gets it sitting nicely. And then beep, 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 
bit that's behind. That's like the the rhythm and the sound that's behind a song. So uh, I've done that before with uh, bus sounds, birds. I, I did a song called For the Birds a couple of years ago, and I sampled uh, bird sounds for that one. So there's different ways to make your song sound interesting and uh, just fi find the rhythms and melodies and sounds in nature or in your urban environment. No, it's a bit hard right now. Grab a pots and pans. Like, seriously, create yourself a weird percussion loop just using some pots and pans and then tune it down an octave and just just experiment and play with it. I think what makes things sound too the same and the reason I hear some music and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I, you, you've used the nitro guitar on that one and then you've used the the uh, the slap bass loop that everyone has in GarageBand, yeah. So if, you, if you're if you finding yourself sounding the same, use up and, and, and play with different sounds and bring in different sounds and it should work for you. Uh, Carlo Maguire says, I want to use GarageBand as a pedal board for my guitar to then plug into an amp. Is there a way to do this? Maybe with iRig, what do you recommend? Yeah, so the easiest way is to use an iRig, the iRig HD or Pro series. I use the iRig Pro IO. Uh, it's a plug and play solution, plug straight into the lightning port or USB for if you've got a USB-C uh, and then it's got a guitar input a combo jack with a mic preamp as well so that means it's really handy for recording but it's great for doing what you've just said there because it's got a uh, three and a half mil headphone jack out and you can just plug that straight out into your gear want to go up to the next level you need to grab something like a usb audio interface something like the steinberg ur22c or a Focusrite scarlet 2i2 something like that to uh, to get the job done and i'm actually checking out in the in the next week and i'll show it now so that i i remember to do it and make sure i make it uh but the folks over at uh, xtone uh, have sent me this, the X-Tone Pro, which is a, called a Smart Stomp. It is a uh, guitar and uh, audio interface, uh, which has stomp, bu stomp buttons. So it's like a pedal board, all-in-one audio interface, guitar interface. So I'm looking forward to playing with that and checking that out. Uh, and apologies to the folks. They sent this uh, to me like several weeks ago. And I just uh, haven't had the time to do it. But in Song Timber, uh, which we'll be talking about in a minute, uh, I'll be uh, getting that one out and testing it out, putting it to the test. Alrighty, uh, scrolling on down. Uh, yes, we have a question. Speaking of Song Temper, we do have a question here about Song Temper from our friend Alex Bacchus. Uh, regarding Song Temper, which I'll tell you about in a moment if you don't know what that is, can one finish and all restart a song and release it? I think my challenge is more to complete and release a song as opposed to start one. Yeah, so the, 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 as I said yesterday, uh, I did a launch show for Song Temper. If you're not familiar with Song Temper, uh, it is a challenge that we do every year, and by every year we did it last year, and we're doing it again this year. It's a challenge where I, I'm challenging you you to create, record, and release an entire song in the month of September. And that means writing, recording, and then releasing it. Now, if, as Alex says here, you have an idea or you've already written part of a song and you want to use that to record and then release, go for it. That's fine. So again, because the what's up for grabs here is just a warm feeling down in the cockles. If you do get it done, it's it's fine. It's not a competition. There's no sort of verses. There's no, I'm not going to count down my favorite songs or anything. It is just an opportunity for me. It's going to kick me in the butt and get me to write and record and release the song. And hopefully folks out there can do the same sort of thing. I'm having trouble with my F's today. <laughs> Uh, anyone would think I have a lisp or something. Um, MM says, uh, hi Pete, what's a good $30 or less mic and $30 or less studio monitor headphones and how can I connect to my iPhone? You are going to struggle, in all honesty, you're probably going to struggle uh, if you getting away with less than $30, to be honest. Um, Headphone-wise, probably something like the ATHX 30s, the Audio-Technica, I think they retail for between $30 and $40, and a lot of people use those and tell me that they're good, the, you know, the, the entry-level Audio-Technica headphones. Uh, microphone for iOS that's going to be under $30 is, is a hard deal, to be honest. You're not going to get much better than the built-in mic. What I would say if you're starting out is to get yourself a pair of headphones that don't have a microphone. So just earbuds or over-the-ear headphones that don't have a microphone, plug them in. So yeah, if you get, say, something like the Audio-Technica ATHX 30 and then plug those in, if you've got a newer iPhone, you'll need what we talked about before, the Lightning to 3.5mm adapter, and then record just using the built-in mic of your iPhone or your iPad, because that's going to be about as good as anything you're going to get for under $30, unfortunately. If you go more to the $50 to $100 range, then you can start getting yourself something like a USB microphone, like a Samson Meteor, or one of the uh, Blue Yeti Nanos, the smaller Blue Yeti mics. Um, but yeah, anything under that 
again, you're not going to get much better than the built-in mic on your actual device. So hopefully, hopefully that helps you out there. Uh, another song timber question, where should I place the hashtag? I'm not on Facebook or Twitter, so not sure. Wherever. So hashtags kind of work the same everywhere. So if you're not on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or anywhere, just put it in the comments here. Um, so it, it won't make much difference. If, uh, there'll be a bunch of videos, basically. So you can, what, what happened last year is some folks were sharing what they were creating on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter uh, and using the hashtag song timber. Other folks were just sharing it in the, the actual video comments. So if there's links to your video, ordinarily, YouTube sort of flags them and says this is spam I make sure I go down and if you're sharing a link to your YouTube channel as long as it's for this purpose where you're actually showing your song then I'll make sure that that gets through and then just put that when you're putting a comment on any on any of those song timber videos just put hashtag song timber just means that it groups all that stuff together if anyone's searching for it they'll be able to find it Alrighty, uh, so questions. Sorry if this has been covered already. I just got in from work. Uh, but is there no, yeah, so Your Music Live, the, the show that we do, um, I've been doing it every week to two weeks. Uh, this is a week off. Um, as you can probably tell, I've got a bit of a, a bit of a problem with my voice and talking for two hours straight just wasn't on the cards yesterday. So we did a quick half hour live show um, where we launched Song Timber. So that was what we did instead of the Your Music Live. But we will be back with more Your Music Live in future weeks. Uh, yeah, it's just around the timing of things that I need to be able to do because it's a, uh, it is a lot of commitment. I know it's, it's a fun show and it's an easy show to do because you think, oh, I just have to sit there and play music. Um, but yeah, it can. It's for two hours in a morning. It can be quite draining and especially with my voice it does take out of me uh, when I've got a bit of a voice lack of this at the moment uh, let's have a look here I'll just see if we have any final questions uh, nope I think we're all good there let's jump on over to these questions because we've got a couple more that we'll jump through here and then we'll finish off here so Michael McCarthy as a question, I have a problem. I have an iPad and an iRig like you have. I've imported a song, but when I'm recording the drums, the audio of the song is on the drum track when I play it back. Please help. I will help you after a drink. Uh, so, what is the problem here? The, the issue here is usually around something called microphone bleed or mic bleed. So what does mic bleed mean, apart from sounding slightly gruesome? Well, microphone bleed means that the sound is coming when you're playing it back. So you're playing back audio. It's playing here, but it's also outputting it to somewhere. Now, if you're using headphones, you're not going to get a lot of bleed because if you're using closed back headphones like these, it's going to isolate that sound around your ear and the amount of bleed coming out of these headphones will be minimal. So when I'm recording a vocal, so I've got my drum track and my guitar track, I've got my phone, I've plugged in my headphones, I'm recording on my microphone here, but guess what? The microphone's not only picking up my voice, it's picking up a little tiny bit of the noise coming from my headphones. And especially if I've got the volume up too loud, it's going to pick up more of that sound. So the way to avoid this couple of ways is to turn down the monitor mix in your headphones. That's obviously number one. If you, if you have that lower, that's going to help you out and it's going to pick up less sound. Uh, and then to make sure that you're using a pair of headphones that are closed back. If they're open back headphones, a lot of noise is coming out. That's not going to work. Using earbuds is actually a good idea because earbuds uh, use natural isolation, noise isolation. Um, so it's not going to cancel the noise. But if you shove them in your ear sockets, then the not much noise is actually coming out unless you're, unless you're on the bus and there's that annoying kid in front of you that seems to be playing terrible music at like 11 and you can hear their music like clearly and you're like my goodness what is happening to your poor little ears uh how much like an old dad man do i sound now yeah oh turn down that music and get off my lawn um sound like gladys worthington mm, there's a, a, a hint there uh we've got a live jade stars doing a live gladys worthington show i'll i'll, I'll pitch that at the end here because they're always a lot of fun um uh, yes so back to this one do that make sure that you know and definitely don't have it playing back through speakers I've seen people go, oh, why am I getting this noise back? And I'm like, you, you're actually just, you're playing back the sound either through your iPhone or iPad speaker or through monitor speakers. That's, of course, going to get in. So you do need to have isolation. The other thing is, if you get a little bit of that bleed, it's natural and it's fine. Because you know what? It's just the track. And if you listen to multi-tracks of really famous recording artists, like old tracks of um, uh, like the Beatles and, and, and other musicians, you'll hear that. They will definitely have some of that bleed in there because that's just na natural. That's just part of the recording process. So don't freak out too much. Um, don't, don't worry too much about bleed. But that's generally what's going to cause that. 
A uh, couple of questions here. Uh, my question is, uh, so this is about video. So uh, I know this is an audio Q&A show, but I know many of you also produce video and release videos, and especially for Song Timber, if you are releasing videos and then you're like, oh no, I forgot to cut out that big two minute section in the middle where I just like swear and yell at my screen. Uh, well, guess what? You can actually edit videos on YouTube. So this is actually a pretty cool tip. Um, you can edit your live streams, but you can also edit released videos. So there is a YouTube studio editor in YouTube. So if you go to your YouTube creator page, creator studio, you can actually go into the editor and you can trim the front, trim the back. And I do this for these shows when I remember to. Uh, so I can trim the front so that I just, that sort of in, in, in intro bit uh, gets cut off and then we're straight into the Q&A. Uh, or if I do something really bad in the middle of a show or, uh, or have a bit of a, a video that I want to remove, you can actually split and trim. So it's very similar to audio editing. You basically just place the point where you want to split it, where you want to cut, and then you drag your trim point out and then you're good to go. You can save it in as a new version and it's a, just a nice way that I've, I've done it before where I've edited it and I thought it was perfect and then I've released it and then I'm like, oh no, I've left in like 10 seconds of heavy breathing, which I forgot to cut. So you can go in and actually cut it after the point. So yes, you can to answer this question, you can cut it in the middle, just use the split function in the YouTube Studio Editor. Uh, can you connect two, so we talked about connecting up drives, connecting hard drives to an iPhone or iPad. Can you connect two hard drives to a non-powered USB hub and power the camera adapter three by a lightning cable with a power bank? Uh, so yes, yes, you, you could. Um, but I don't know that it would work that well. The, the reason I recommend a powered USB hub is it just works. And there are ways around. People have said to me, Pete, I use a, a lightning to USB three adapter that I just plug that power port into a battery or a PowerPoint and it works fine. And I'm like, cool, more power to you. Uh, I've tried it and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So what has always worked for me is plugging in a powered USB hub and then plugging that in and then powering up my iPad separately via the Lightning to USB 3 adapter. And then every device I plug into that powered USB hub is receiving power and it just works. So right now I've got my keyboard and mouse and I've got my Steinberg UI22C plugged into a four port hub. I've got two ports free there if I wanna plug in a USB drive or a MIDI keyboard, I'm good to go. I know that they're just sitting there, powered ports ready to go and accept whatever I want. So there's ways around it, but like most things, by the time you've done a workaround just to save yourself getting a thing, you've probably spent as much money and you've definitely probably spent as much time and frustration in the effort of trying to get something done in a different way. So uh, there you go. One final question here from Shal Tholo. So would anyone tell me if I can hook up a speaker from an iPhone if it's hooked up to the MIDI keyboard? Now, this one is an interesting question and I'm going to see if I can find the video that I did because I, I thought I had the actual device here, the, the prop, but I don't have it. So I'm just going to come and search. Uh, bah, 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 bah. I think it's MIDI headphone. I'm just going to search and see if I can find it. Yes, here it, it is. So I'm just going to... I'm going to uh, come back from here. We're going to undo that. <coughs> Stop that mirroring. And then I'll bring this up on the screen because I'll just show you quickly what uh, I recommend. So I recommend this little device here. If you've not seen these before, these are little uh, USB hub. I'll just uh, come in here and play the video real quick. So uh, yes, that's my keyboard when I'm Pete. Show us the actual thing. There it is. So this is the, the device. You can pick these up on Amazon and eBay for only about what, 10 bucks, $15. As uh, so you can see there, they've got headphones jacks. They've actually got three and a half mil input and output. And then they've got three USB ports there. So connect, connecting these up with your iPhone to your, uh, to your lightning to USB adapter, and then plugging that into your MIDI keyboard, that actually works a treat because you then get a headphone jack. Because the problem is once you use your lightning port, so unlike this, once you use your lightning port for um, connecting up USB devices, you don't get any sound output. So if you're playing a MIDI keyboard and you can't monitor the sound, you need something like that. Now, a better quality way to go would be to use something we've talked about before, like an iRig or um, uh, an actual audio interface. But if you want to do it on the cheap and you don't need the audio interface for anything else in particular, pause this video, uh, then you can go ahead and use that. So if you search, all I searched there was Pete John's MIDI headphone and it found that for me. So uh, you can do the same. You can find that and many other videos over on the channel. Um, I think, well, one more question here from Matthias. Uh, excuse me a moment. 
Sorry about that. Uh, question, how do you make the 808 bass sound like this type of beat? Make the 808 sound like this type of beat. I don't know what type of beat you want, but there's heaps of videos around 808. I've done a couple of videos on getting a good 808 sound. So search my name and 808 or search uh, other places around. Um, yeah, there's lots of lots of cool. Uh, the uh, bass, uh, what is it? The uh, Alchemy Synth. Uh, that has some good bass sounds, the Alchemy synth there, uh, with a lot of the 808 sounds. Righty dokey. Uh, so thank you for being here today. Uh, that is going to do it for this week and for this episode of Home Studio Q&A. We will be back uh, coming up today. As I mentioned before, Jade Star is doing a, a bit of a fun live stream. If you haven't checked out her live streams, go ahead and do that. Uh, her, ch her channel, she'll uh, throw a link uh, for us down while I do my, my outro bit here so that uh, you can get over and check that one out. Uh, I've then got the happy hour. So with all the song timber fun, I haven't really talked about it much, but uh, I have released an EP, uh, a six-track EP called Own Battle. It's available for pre-save and pre-order now. You can go to petejohns.com slash own battle and uh, check that one out. Uh, battle, I know I say battle fun. Battle, battle, own, own battle. Yeah, uh, own battle. Uh, so what I'm doing today in the happy hour is I'll do an acoustic recording, uh, acoustic version of those six songs. So we'll just be hanging out. I'll play those six songs and maybe a couple of, you know, bonus tracks, uh, like the old days with CDs. You'd always have bonus tracks, wouldn't you? So we'll be fill the hour with a couple of uh, tracks uh, there as well. And then, of course, tomorrow... We have uh, we have Garage Band Weekly for my Garage Band fans, and uh, the the awesome Patrick from the Garage Band Guide will be my special guest co-host on that one. So you won't want to miss that one. So uh, join me again in a few hours' time. Catch Jade's show, which uh, she's uh, thrown a link to uh, down there. She said it should be it should be a car crash which is always good. I always say that about live shows anyway. Yeah, you, you'll either see a well-oiled machine or a car crash or a bit of both, and it's always fun. Uh, and uh, for those that uh, join me on the happy hour, I will see you there in a few hours' time as well. That is going to do it for this one. Head over to studiolivetoday.com to find out all the ways that you can connect with me and stay in touch with everything here on the channel. Until next time, yes, uh, get cracking, uh, get thinking about those song timber songs, get ready to, to, uh, to release... And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Uh, yeah, keep creating. Be nice to yourself. Be kind to others. And I'll see you real soon. Bye now.